Hey, I'm James, and this is Digital Charcuterie. Joining me today to talk about Batman is Brian. How's it going, Brian? I'm good, man. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Thanks for joining me. You are a big Batman fan, if I am not mistaken. Somewhat big Batman fan. I'd like to think so. <laughs> I, know my, I know my fair share, I guess. You, you, uh, you are like an animator, cartoonist. Why don't you give everybody a little bit about your background? I, I am an animator, cartoonist, illustrator, the whole nine, pretty much. <laughs> I work. I work as a graphic designer, um, full time at Global News right now. But on the side, I do a lot of uh, side projects. A lot of side projects. We won't get into that because we got to get right into the Batman. There but you have done you have done a poster for one of my films in the past, and you're doing another poster for me. Uh, Only so, one? sure, I've done uh, one. <laughs> yeah, but one that people have seen. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> one of my films. One of my films people saw. But you're working on another one, so that's why we're doing this. I'm holding you hostage until I get that in my hands. And part of that hostage is I'm going to make you do this. I'm just joking. Um, no, you do great work. You're working on some really cool stuff right now. Like I said, we'll talk about that some other time. But now we're going to talk about the Batman. You grew up yes. with the Batman. Um, who was Adam West? Your first Batman that you saw, like me? Yes. Like was it Adam West? Yeah, yeah. And you thought um, nothing. Are you like me though, right? Where you thought nothing of it? They're like, this is just the best Batman of all time. <laughs> Honestly, when I was young, I was actually threatened by my parents that if I don't do my homework well, I couldn't watch sixty six Batman. And so I did my homework as best I could, so I could watch sixty six Batman. Yeah, no, I think I think anyone growing up in the 80s first knew of the 66 Batman before the comics or before the animation or anything like that. At least that, at least that was my experience. Anyway. Yeah, no, me too. And then there was Super Friends. It was always Adam West. Adam West was yes. always Batman. But now here we are, 40 years later, and this Batman graces the screen. We have Matt Reeves as director. He also co-wrote it. And then you got Robert Pattinson in his Batman. Everyone knows, right? Uh, Colin Farrell, Zoe Kravitz, uh, Jeffrey Wright, mm -hmm. John Turturro. The cast is just phenomenal. It's all in there. So you walk into this movie. You finally see this movie. You walk in. You grow up with 66. You got Michael Keaton, Christian Bale. I have all these other Batmans. What are your thoughts? If positioned a different way, this could have even been a prequel to the Keaton Batman, if they so wanted it to be. There's a lot of tie-ins with almost every single movie um if you're up on the comics you could really really capture and see every single influence from every book that was put into this thing and in a lot of ways i kind of personally felt that this was a i'm not going to be as good as the dark knights but i'm going to be better than rises and i'm going to show you why and i felt in a lot of ways that this was leaps and bounds better than that I had a couple of issues with it, but I mean only two or three. And for a three-hour movie, that's pretty damn good. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into some issues, issues, of course. For me, what I, my big takeaway, and again, guys, there will be spoilers for the Batman going into this. So if you don't want to be spoiled from this point out, I would probably just walk away and you know give it a little bookmark and come back to it after you've seen it. But for me, what I loved, you kind of alluded to this, was all the tie-ins that it had. It had respect for yes. every Batman that seemed to have come before. And we just talked off the top about Batman 66 on purpose because I found so many in this movie that harkened back to that show. You know, there was, uh, I mean, it wasn't Anne Harriet. Obviously, it was Dory, but it was the same person, let's be honest. Like, you had her in there. And then you have, you know, the old phone, the bat phone that he called to get a hold of uh, Alfred, which was very reminiscent of stuff they would do in the 60s. Uh, I saw. I didn't see this in the movie, but somebody mentioned that there's actually a Shakespeare bust in one of the the rooms in there. Yeah, there, so there was, was little there things. Was. Yeah, and also like his mask was very reminiscent of of Adam West, not uh, at first glance, but it had eyebrows in it. They weren't sketched on with chalk like Adam West, but they were they, they were indented been. in there. Yeah, they should they should have had white eyebrows on that mask. Would have been awesome. But they worked on it. They probably would have. But there was there were things like that that alluded to it, and. And it just felt like um, they took all that appreciation and then they took a story that they wanted to give to us and relate to us and they combined them all. And for me, it just all worked perfectly. Yeah, I have no disagreement there. I didn't, I've only seen the movie once, 
I know a bunch of people since it came out probably seen it three, four, five times, so I'm kind of lagging there. But I didn't see the 66 references until you mentioned them. I really think back to that. Yeah, that's very true. The thing that caught me the most, you know, other than everything else in the movie, the thing that caught me the most was Wayne Manor itself. It it echoed like a church. It also had the gothic vibes of what Tim Burton would have done in the eight in the eighty eight sorry in eighty nine film. It it just looked almost too over the top. Where I kind of thought to myself, what self respecting doctor would actually purchase something like this to live in? It just it looked a little bit too over the top for me, but. Within the aspect of the film, yeah, it worked fine. Yeah, that's one thing that I liked is that it didn't look practical. It looked yeah. over the top. It looked, it did look over the top, and that for me that was almost a positive because I kind of want Wayne Manor and Gotham as a whole to look over the top and not quite our reality. I want, I want the billionaires to live in what billionaires would live in in Gotham City, not what they would live in where we live, which you know would be a shack. <laughs> Because house prices are so expensive, but that's kind of I kind of I, I appreciate that the aesthetic was very nice. Like you said, it was it was kind of reminiscent to you know medieval to the Tim Burton look yeah. of it, and I love the Tim Burton Gotham City. I love that it was like the 1940s blended in with the 80s. I kind of love that they meshed it. This one, it, this one felt modern, but it felt like a, an old city in modern that they never really that they didn't do too much to to uh modernize but yeah. it felt like it was it felt like it was 2022 but it was a it was like a, a city from like 1890 that they added a couple screens to in the square and i really i really love that look of it well yeah you hit, you hit the nail on the head just like when i said that sorry when you said that burton was trying to get an aesthetic of the 80s with medieval times kind of built into that aspect of the, and the gothic nature of it this did the exact same thing just with modern times. And it, it blended perfectly. This is absolutely the best Gotham City that we've ever had, bar none, in any of the films. I never liked the Gotham City in The Dark Knight and The Rises, and The Dark Knight trilogies. I, I didn't like the idea of, oh, I can just walk out my door and, and this is it. I felt like that was more so something from Marvel or something like that. Like I like the idea of DC as something that's more imaginative. And that's what this one kind of gave us. Yeah, I agree. Like the Dark Knight, as great as it is, it begins is a little different because I almost yeah. felt like Gotham City changed. Like they just changed everything about Gotham between Begins and Dark Knight, and they were just like, "Nah, it's just Chicago. It's just going to be <laughs> Chicago. Don't pretend it's anything else." And yeah, that was for me. Gotham City was always a, a weakness of the Dark Knight trilogy. And if you're going to have a weakness, it might as well just be the city. But exactly. this one, this one needed. It also needed to be something different because Gotham is a main character in this movie. Like Gotham is, I, I was interpreting it as Gotham's actually the villain of this movie. Riddler's a part of it. Right? Riddler's part of mm -hmm. Gotham's gang of villains and Gotham was the big bad and it was trying to figure out how to overcome all of that. And that's what I loved. And, and But again, The Dark Knight, and those are great movies on their own. They, they didn't necessarily need Gotham City to be anything more than it was, but it's still, yeah. it's if, it, if that movie's going to have a weakness, it's going to be, the city itself. Let's talk about this movie, though, in comparison to the comics that you've read your whole life. Let's go right into that, because Matt Reeves, you know, we could talk about the comparisons to other movies all we want. The reality is we don't even know what the comparisons were. I know that that the producer, yeah. I know that the producer I read called a producer on the Dark Knight and says, we're coming for you. We're going to make a better movie than you. And I, I really love that because go big or go home, right? Like, if you're not going to try to beat the best, why even bother? But, but the comics is where this really came from. So why don't you, let's go into the long Halloween a little bit. And why don't you talk about a little bit about what they borrowed from there and how they maybe, uh, they maybe improved on it. Or maybe there were some things in long Halloween, Brian, that you thought could have been used better. Well, the biggest thing that they have with the long Halloween is it's kind of glaring because since the new 52, they combined the story of the long Halloween and Catwoman by making Catwoman the daughter of Carmine Falcone. And I'm not a huge fan that every single character has to be related to someone in that regard, but it really worked in this respect. I loved Carmine Falcone. John Turturro was absolutely so amazing good. in this. Yeah. Like he's, he's amazing in everything. Um, but in this movie, I really bought him as Carmine Falcone. And the funniest thing is, He's, he's a very tall, lanky guy. And when you see all these illustrations, 
especially from the recent Long Halloween animes movie, Falcone is a very imposing figure. Like, like he has a like he has muscle mass, and when you look at him, you're scared to look at him physically. I didn't yeah. get that when I looked at Taturo, but when he talked, that's when you got the fear aspect from him, and it just worked nicely. And again, just the idea that he's the father of Catwoman worked perfectly for me. And that was the other thing in regards to the storyline that I liked the most, that they didn't dip into Frank Miller's origin for Catwoman, which personally I hated. My wife and I don't like that because Catwoman, Selena Kyle, I, I don't personally feel should ever be seen as a prostitute. And I didn't care for that in year one. I know most, one of the most beloved Batman stories, but that one aspect I didn't like. I liked how in this one she was just flat out a person working in this cesspool of a city, but not really selling out her own morals to get what she wants. And that's what I like about her the most. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I was never a big fan of that aspect of year one either, but I liked how this one kind of like it teetered that line mm -hmm. where she was almost that, but it was also a PG version of that. And I think it worked a lot better because, yeah. you know, I, I yeah, there's just something about that aspect to the character in, in year one that I never, I don't know, I've never, it's never struck me. I've never really enjoyed it. I didn't think Catwoman needed that, but I loved, I loved the way they used her in this and they used her as the server in the, in, and the uh, Iceberg Lounge and 44 Below. And I loved, I don't know if you remember, but there's there was pictures of her and Falcone at, at the funeral on the steps. Yes. And she's yeah. dressed as the woman who comes out to be his girlfriend. And that was a good a good bait and switch that they pulled on uh -oh. us in the Cephos. Yeah, because I thought, oh, here comes Catwoman. There's like, what? What happened? And mm -hmm. and yeah, they totally, they totally uh, bait and switched us there. So I, I, loved, I loved that. Any other stuff that you could relate to? To specifically right now, the long Halloween. Um, I'm sure I'm I'm not remembering every single thing that I should have <laughs> <laughs> that I really should, but that's those are the ones that came out the most to me in regards to being part of the long Halloween. It's been a very long time since I read the book, and honestly, the animated movie is more fresh in my mind. And they take liberties in those animated films, but not, oh, and they usually, totally yeah, they of course they do. But they they they've been pretty good with their animated stuff. Of course, this this movie. The thing also with this movie that is up there with the Dark Knight is that they are both solid films. Like these are, it, it doesn't rely on Batman, or it relies on a good story and a good film. And the Dark Knight is heat. I always like to say, and this one. Is definitely you know their Zodiac Seven Chinatown. That's what this one is, and you totally yeah. feel it. It really reminds me of the Joker and the Joker's you know just being a Martin Scorsese movie from the eighties. That's what this the seventies and eighties. That's what this one felt in terms of like serial killer detective stuff. How did you feel about the detective aspect of Batman? Because that's something that everybody forever has been like he's the greatest detective, world's greatest detective. But they never put that in the movies. Now we get it in the movies. Did you find that? I thought it was, but did you find it satisfying his portrayal as a detective? His portrayal, as a detective, his portrayal as a detective was absolutely spot on and perfect because, yeah, I could repeat everything you just said, everything that everybody said. In every movie that we have gotten that isn't animated series based, yeah. he's never live been action, seen, yeah. yeah, he's never been seen as a guy with all that much going up there. He's either been seen as just a ninja or seen as a scary being of darkness. That's it. We never really got to go in depth into his brain. And I find that they do it with a lot of comic book things. But in this movie, they really got to slow down. And that's the and that's the key aspect. Maybe it's because of the runtime that they were able to do a little bit more with it. But when you go from Keaton's Batman to Bale's, every single one of them, hell, even with the Schumacher movies, they are all overly fast paced. And always one thing has to be taken away. And in my mind, it's always his over-intelligence. In this movie, I feel like we got the good, well-rounded Batman. He's a detective, and we got to see how hard of a detective he was in this. He's also ridiculously intelligent. In the scene where um, the would-be mayor, the, the, who, was, who was murdered in the first part of the film, and his thumb was cut off, he just looked at it very carefully and said, yeah, that's da 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 And the other guys was like, oh, shoot, yeah, he's right. Just, just by look by glancing quickly, they really got to make his mind 
the biggest important thing in this movie. And we never, ever really truly got that. It was always the Bat computer solving it for him, like Keaton when trying to figure out the Joker's uh, chemical compounds. Or with Bale looking for evidence, but he's using his machines to solve everything where it's not really him. Yeah, it takes some intelligence to understand and do the readouts, but he pretty much just bought equipment and the equipment told him the answers. This Bruce Wayne has all the cool tech, but it just gives him partial analyses and it's up to him to put every single piece together. And that's the best part about this movie. The entire movie was a giant jigsaw. And you got to see him piece everything together. I, I, I thought his intelligence was fantastic. I thought it was great. I thought Robert Pattinson, a lot of people are like saying, he seems to be on the top of a lot of people's best Batman list now, but a lot of people are also saying like, I don't like emo Batman. And he's too emo and he has no emotion and no range. And I'm like, are you kidding me? His eye acting in this movie yes. was better than like him. Okay. His Batman, his performance, Bruce Wayne aside, his performance as Batman was the best Batman acting we've ever gotten because He's the only Batman that actually had to, like you said, detective work. He was the only Batman that had to do anything. He had to convey emotion. And half the time he wasn't even talking. It was just his eyes. And there's that part, especially in the, with the Riddler in, in Arkham, where he just looks at the camera and looks at him. And you don't know if the Riddler knows who he is and he's not sure. Then he's like, am I going to have to like let my guard down? What's going on? And that's all facial expressions, which is harder. Yeah. The hardest acting is reacting, right? That's what they always say. And he was mm-hmm. crushing the reacting in this one. And a lot of it was the detective work, and he had to figure it out. And it was it was a lot of fun. And part of the detective work that he has with this is with Commissioner, Lieutenant, whatever the hell he is, Jim Gordon. <laughs> One day, Brian, they're just going to make this guy a commissioner because he we know where it's going. Just <laughs> right, make right, a commissioner. Right from the jump, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, all right, he's a lieutenant. Well, he'll be commissioner at some point. But we, so we get Gordon. And this one, I look, I like Jeffrey Wright. I think he's great. Gary Oldman was a fantastic Gordon. But I thought Gordon in this movie was the best uh portrayal of the character we can you know acting i don't think you know oldman and right i don't i wouldn't debate that but the character himself going toe to toe with batman being by his side the whole time acting basically as his robin in this i love i love jim gordon in this movie what i like the most with the two of their dynamic is that we didn't just like how we weren't bogged down with the um gunshots and pearls and seeing the uh the death of the Waynes. We didn't have to go. Yeah, we didn't have to go through any of the nonsense of, oh, I don't trust you, or I don't trust you. Well, you have to do something for me to trust you. Okay, you saved my life. Now I trust you. I pretty much summed up their entire dynamic from the Dark Knight. In this case, no, he's been around for two years, and Gordon's the only one who trusts him. I find it hilarious that the police commissioner would allow Gordon to have a searchlight on the top of the building to call the Batman or to allow him to be involved in the actual crime scene investigations. That part was kind of iffy to me, but I liked it for one reason, and I'll get back to that. I just love the fact that we didn't have to go through all of that nonsensical history. They did the same thing with the new Spider-Man movies. We didn't need to know about Uncle Ben. We all know who Spider-Man is. Let's just go and see him do some cool shit. And that's what we got to do in this with Gordon and Batman. We know who they are. We know their dynamics. We know that eventually Bruce is going to take his daughter on and lie to him and say, oh, I don't know where Barbara is. Meanwhile, she's swinging around risking her life, in, which is going to happen in the new Batgirl movie. We'll talk about that later. It's just really cool to see the two of them just doing cool detective work stuff. Nothing more, nothing less. I thought that was, I thought that was great. That's my your point to, to Pete Savage, Commissioner Savage, allowing that to happen. <laughs> I was I, I I know what you're saying, and I I think the the I guess what I'll say uh, to on the flip side of that is maybe he allowed him to use the Batman because he kind of knew the Batman was on their side. He didn't fully trust him. Batman doesn't trust him, but Savage is also a dirty cop, right? So once well, the, you know, there's some dirt going around him. So maybe he allowed Gordon to have the Batman to keep the Batman away from him and his dirt, right? The, awesome. Keep your keep your friends close, your enemies closer. That kind of thing. Where it's like, hey, if I keep him close to my vest, I kind of show that I kind of trust him. He can be on it. And we also don't know in those two years, 
obviously in those two years, actually, Brian, that Batman has brought down the Joker. We don't know what kind of level villain. He yeah. wasn't fully the Joker yet, as Matt Reeves has said. He's kind of whatever. But we know that he's not a good criminal. He's definitely done some bad crap in the past. So he's taken down the Joker. And then that deleted scene, the Joker refers to that day as it's almost their anniversary, saying that he's been in prison for at least a year. Maybe I mean, he was the first one of the first ones he caught. He's not his first because if the prequel novel tells you it's not. But that's happened. So maybe Savage kind of reluctantly, because Savage Savage trusts Gordon so much and Gordon is able to trust the Batman so much, that's why Savage allows that to happen. Also, do we know what building the bat signal was on? All this time, I thought it was police headquarters, but you're right. It didn't look like police headquarters. No, it's like I loved where I loved the where they were on the on like the the rafters area maybe, where they had to take that elevator up. It's a like construction site. Maybe it's on top of Gordon's building. But he that's drives true. there. Yeah, his, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I don't know where to, we'll have to figure it. Out. I'm sure somebody in the comments is like, "It's actually at 227 Gotham Drive." That's how it usually happens if somebody's in there. But this was phenomenal. I love their dynamic. And you, you touched upon Catwoman just, just a little bit early on. Uh, yeah. We've had so many Catwomen over the years. Especially, I mean, the 66 show had 17 of them. Like, just nonstop <laughs> Catwoman. And then we had the iconic live, Halle. Catwoman. Yeah, exactly. We've had the iconic Halle Berry who blew everyone away with her Razzie Award winning uh, Catwoman movie. I sense then, the salt when you say that. Like, come on. I, have, I actually haven't seen it. I'm not going to lie. I haven't seen it. You, have, you it's haven't on, seen that movie. No, it's not. Do you blame me? Uh, I, kinda. <laughs> you're, you're hosting a Batman show. You should have seen that one. Like, I probably on. will. It's on Crave. No, I'm not going to pay to watch it. But 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 we have Michelle Pfeiffer, who is very iconic. Everybody loved it. And, and Hathaway, who was, I would say, was fine. Like, I thought Anne Hathaway was fine. She did. That was, she just did what she was there to do. I don't think she went over the top or anything. It was just, that was it. Uh, but now we have Zoe Kravitz coming in. And we did talk about her a little bit. I thought this was a fantastic portrayal of Catwoman from obviously the uh, the club stuff, Iceberg uh, Lounge and 44 Below. But then the character herself, she was the cat thief, right? And then she, she, she Zoe Kravitz got in trouble because she was, uh, she mentioned that Catwoman, she played her as bisexual on the plot. I think clearly, clearly alludes to her being bisexual in the plot. I don't think they strayed away from that. It didn't take away, but I, I, I really liked that they gave her this storyline of her trying to find her quote unquote roommate. I, I really liked that angle. And then I loved how that angle played in even further to my favorite Batman villain, the penguin. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that was what, that was well done with that too. It just, again, shows that she has a life outside of whatever she's doing in the iceberg lounge. No, everything with Zoe Kravitz was fantastic. And I've been reading so many people saying, Oh, which one's the best? Catwoman, this, that, and the other. It's hard to really give that assessment because let's be completely honest, we've never actually had a true to form Catwoman, period. Uh, the Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman. That was just a fanciful creation from Tim Burton's mind. That has that Selena Kyle had nothing to do with the comic book whatsoever. It was a great performance, but it wasn't the true Catwoman. And Hathaway's, yeah, she was a little bit more towards leaning towards the character, but not really especially being more hyper-realistic world than that was. No, in all honesty, Zoe Kravitz, as best as we can say it, she is the 100% from the comic book's inspiration, which is great. Only just one step below Halle Berry's amazing performance, but we can debate that any day of the week. But no, Zoe Kravitz was, was absolutely phenomenal as Catwoman. I know oh, she sorry, took this as role Selena really. Kyle, As Selena, Selena Kyle. Because I can't really call her Catwoman just yet. I, I consider her more to be Selena Kyle in that regard, more so than Catwoman. Oh, well, that's what Ben Reeves always said, right? He said this is an origin story for the Rogue Gallery, not for Batman. Batman's already had his origin in the past. This is for the villains. This is the villains coming out party. This is when we see them become who they become, and that's evident at the very end when Penguin is looking at when the can we the Penguin scene when Falcone is shot, Brian. His, Colin, Fer I thought Colin Fer was great the whole time. He was in it more than I anticipated him to be in this movie because he kept yeah, saying I thought, six I thought was, Yeah, I thought he was going to be in just a little bit, just a couple of scenes. Yeah, I, like after the car chase, I'm like, oh, he's done. He just kept coming back, and then he's even in this one shot where Falcone is playing pool, and he goes, "Okay, guys, let's walk away." And he walk. I'm like, they, that's a silhouette. And Colin Farrell went through like four hours of makeup yeah. just to walk out of a shot. I'm like, that is awesome. But at the very end, 
when my, I think one of my favorite moments of this movie um, in retrospect, because I think it's a very powerful moment is when Falcone um, comes out into the light and it's, and it's revealed that he is the rat penguins reaction to that was, I thought one of the strongest parts of the movie, because in that moment, because penguin was interrogated for being the rat earlier yeah. But he's not the rat. And you learn that Penguin is a very, very faithful guy. Like, he is a true mafioso in this, right? He is a mobster yes. to the core. He believes he is, that's his family. Those are his people. He wouldn't do anything to compromise them. And to find out that the head of his family was the one that compromised everybody, the, ups, the, the disdain in his tone, the, the, he was depressed, angry, every, like he had all those range of emotions through makeup, nonetheless. Yeah. And it all came through. And then he was about to pull the trigger. And then he went down. And then there's that moment when the cop's going to go, I didn't shoot him. I didn't shoot him. And I just think that, that his reaction to Falcone, I can't remember exactly what he says now. It's on the tip of my tongue, but he had, he says something to Falcone in that moment. And it just, for me, that was, it's one of the strongest points of the movie and it's going to be, that is going to be the penguin that we're going to get in the HBO show and beyond. Because at the end, when he looks into the sunrise or the sunset, he's like pure, that's Scarface right there. Right. He's, and he literally has a scar in his face and that's, that's his moment. That's his, his coming out party is now at hand. See, I'm glad you mentioned that part where he takes out his gun and he's about to shoot him. See that word about to shoot him. If he wasn't being, um, restrained by anyone, and if Riddler didn't take his shot at Falcone, he was going to flat out murder Falcone in front of Lieutenant Gordon, all the cops, in front of Batman. That just shows his level of commitment to his particular cause. And that's why I liked that they used him in this movie, because Penguin, to, the, to any eye, he's not a loyal person because he's a villain. But in this film, he's loyal to the mob. He's loyal to himself, but he doesn't disparage himself to let the mob stuff go lower. He does what he has to to bring his crew higher. He did great in that regard. And when I watched that scene, all I could do was just have like these like imaginations of what if he actually pulled the trigger? What if he actually did kill him? Or hell, let's just say, what if Riddler shot him, but then he also took a shot too? So there's two bullet holes inside of, of Falcone, and he actually did it. What would that do if he was in prison? Would that up his respect level in prison? Would he would he have more control of the prison system inside that? Those are things that I would have liked to have seen as well. So yeah, I I can't say that I'm looking forward to watching the Penguins um, standalone TV series, but it's definitely something I'm going to watch and. I just can't wait to see what more we do with that character. And I love the fact more so that, again, we're in a Batman movie and none of the villains are dead. And that's just great because then you could easily dip back into that pool and pull those characters back for another film. Even if it's just for like, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, just something. We have that option now. I mean, hell, Nolan had that option with Scarecrow. And as far as I'm concerned, he kind of didn't use him to his utmost in any of the other films. He was just there as like a laughing stock for the other two movies. I, I like Scarecrow's use in The Dark Knight, kind of like as, oh, this guy's still there. And then in Rises, which I really like Rises, I think it was weird. But um, no, they didn't. But they didn't use him to his full full effect. I think I see. I thought going into this movie, I heard rumors that Mad Hatter might be in it as like a drug dealer. No, that I was, would have been great. That I, oh man, I wish you didn't tell me that. That kind of gets me mad now. I would love to have seen Jervis Tetch in this in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, that would see, be I, beautiful. I, I was waiting for it. I thought it would be cool, and obviously it's not in there. But for, for me, the you know, the power of the Joker being in prison is that Joker exists. And if Joker exists, a million other of these Batman villains that we know and love could already be, be out there lurking in the shadows. Making a uh, making a play in some capacity, and like you said, these villains maybe in the sequel, Riddler is not in the sequel, or he has a small role in the sequel. But maybe if they make you know when they make the third one, he has a bigger role in the third one, or vice versa. Who knows? But he is around, and I thought that was great because ever since Jack Nicholson, they've had this obsession with just offing the villains, and like yeah. every superhero movie, it's like let them go, continue them, you know, give and them I an feel, arc. I sorry, I don't need to interrupt, but I feel like they really took a page 
out of Marvel's Handbook with Daredevil, one of my favorites uh, of the Marvel franchises. And just looking at that with three seasons of a series, and Kingpin was only in one of them for probably just one episode, less than an episode. But the point is, he's alive. He's not dead. And they bring him back for every other, for every episode in the third season. And now he's being built up as one of the prominent villains in the new homogenized MCU, which I think is just wonderful that now we can see Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin. Whether it's the same one from Netflix or not, I don't care. We get to see Vincent D'Onofrio as the Kingpin with other characters. And I think that's wonderful. And I really do feel like DC, because let's be honest, all DC has ever done is play catch up with the Marvel, with the Marvel Universe and poorly, in all honesty. But in this instance, letting Paul Daniels Riddler live is the smartest decision they can make. He doesn't have to be in the Batman sequel. If they do make one or not, I'm not sure. It made so much money, he probably definitely will. He doesn't have to be in the, in the second one. He doesn't have to be in the third one. He could be in the fourth one. They have options, and that's what they need to do. Because if they just cycle through all of these villains and doing them two at a time, like they seem to be doing now, then who's going to be left for us to get as a villain? Professor Pig? Maybe. I don't mind Professor Pig, but I don't want to see him in the movies. It's going to be Ventriloquist and Professor Pig in part five. That's what I love, though, is the character, the villains not only survive, there's multiple of them in this movie. And the thing that they do different in this movie versus the other Batman movies where there was too many villains is these villains serve the plot. They serve the narrative. Yeah. They were characters in the grand in the larger story at hand. They weren't They weren't the story. It wasn't Penguin. Penguin's the bad guy. What's his plot? Penguin had a plot. It was going on, but that was the side story to the main yep. story, and we just weaved in and out of his story. Right? And I thought that was the best way to portray him. Selena Kyle got a little bit more of the storyline, but her storyline affected the overall plot a lot more than Penguin's did, so that made a lot of sense. Falcone was there, obviously. Riddler's doing his thing. And then Mad Hatter was lurking in the shadows of Mayo Manor. I don't know if you saw it. You didn't catch that. You didn't catch. <laughs> I thought I honestly, when they go into Wayne Manor and it's all like the drug, the druggies in there. I was like, here we go. Here comes Mad Hatter, and uh, he did not pop up. Obviously, honestly, I like I like the idea that you threw out there with the uh, with the ventriloquist and Scarface. That that could have worked so well in this world that's created. It's such a silly, stupid idea that it would work perfectly. That this big bad who's controlling everything is this little ventriloquist dummy. And this dude who looks like the original Alfred just comes out. Like, if he was still living, God rest his soul, I would love for the dude from Birds of Prey who played Alfred in that. He would have been the perfect um, ventriloquist. I would, have loved to, I would have loved to have had him play that character if we're fan casting in that regard. But I guess we anyways. are. Now we can so, think as all we want. That's what we do. I, I think. I think though, if Matt, Reeve, Matt Reeves blew us out of the park with this one. He blew the whole thing out of the water. And I think if you want to do a sequel and you want to blow us out of the water again, you bring in. The, you bring in a character like Ventriloquist, someone that is ridiculous, and then you make us believe that yeah. that is a, a real threat. And you bring it down to reality. He keeps ta- teasing Mister Freeze and Hush and all these. Like those are great go a little crazy why don't you go a little crazy you made apes talk and take over the world and we bought into it why don't you do something a little bit more off the cuff but i look he he delivered a film when i left the theater i was like oh i watched a movie like i didn't like i love the spider you know i love spider-man i love all the spider-man movies for better or worse but you know like no way home is a lot of fun but it's like you know it's a lot more like disposable than Batman, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like this was like a movie that I think is going to stand the test of time. Like, this is going to be a movie that in twenty years you can still look back on and be like, "That's a great film." No I don't Way know Home if it's going to. Ex- no Way Home was an experience where this is a flat out piece of cinema. Yeah, plain, plain and, and simple. And they're both great. Like, you, I wouldn't compare. I would never compare them because they're very no. different. You know, you don't watch No Way Home for a great detective movie. It's just not what it is. I, I, I the one thing, the one flaw for this movie for me, above all, is that this was not made for the TikTok generation. I just can't see the TikTokers like liking this movie all that much. It is a very slow burn. It's one yeah. that you, and if you don't buy into it right off the bat, you're just not going to. Speaking of off the bat, the Riddlers. Uh, introduction in this i thought was great i love i love that halloween jack uh reacher 
kind of element up at the beginning. And then that horror movie that he has where the first time you see him in the mayor's condo was just like, I thought that was yeah. such a great moment. And the way he just sat there and stared and waited. I just, that's, I think when I was bought into this movie, Brian, because I, that moment, everyone complains about the runtime. Sure. But it didn't care. It was like, that scene could have been a lot quicker, but I just love that it took its time and it made you wait. You know what's coming, and it just made you wait for it. And I and I loved, I loved that they had that kind of dedication and love for the craft when making this movie. I liked, I loved the the Riddler's entrance. Um, the part that I liked the most, which is it, it, it was very grotesque, but and I don't I don't know how um, grotesque I can be uh, with my language or anything like that. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. Sorry. Um, what are you gonna say? I was gonna say no f bombs. <laughs> no f bombs. No, no. I was, I was gonna say f bombs. No, nothing like that. Nothing like that. Um, but after he did, after he was finished pummeling the the mayor or the would be mayor, he just sits there on top of him, breathing heavily, and it, huh. and then reaching into his pocket, and it was very, very deceptive where he was placing his hands. It's like it's like I said to myself, Peter. He's like getting off on this. Like, he is, <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there, he was. There, there is a sense of of true, utter satisfaction with what he did. Like how normal people would go out and make a good dinner for their family, and how they would enjoy, it. and it gives that person that sense of satisfaction inside them that they did something well for someone else. This guy just felt, oh yes, I just killed this fool reaching my pants here and it's just like yo what is he doing here and he takes out the tape it i i love that scene for what it was because it told me everything as to what we're going to be getting from this guy and he followed that through line right to the very end and that intro did a lot for me the only 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 gripe i have against the riddler and maybe it's just because i'm a huge fan of the original Riddler, I'm a huge fan of Gorshin. The only thing I would have loved to have seen was to have Paul Dano kind of do what Stephen Amell did in Arrow and just put grease paint over his eyes to kind of make a mask out of that, whereas opposed to the gimp mask that he wore in this movie. That was the only thing. Because he kind of he kind of felt like weak bane to me. But other, other than that, I just thought he served his purpose and he did it absolutely well i think his reasoning for that mask was so that he wouldn't there would be no dna left behind oh no I it's, it's that's understandable sort of, I, I i get I, the reason for it but did you catch in his in his apartment there was like that like mannequin with the purple bandana around it yes head? i saw that yeah all, all in i think i think this riddler is becoming the riddler that we know where, because now he won't have to wear a mask anymore, right? He's not going to have to do that. I think he's slowly becoming, you know, the bull cap kind of Riddler that we know and love from the comics and stuff like that. And I, I, I think he's slowly going a little bit. I don't think he was crazy, like insane in this movie. I, and I think he's getting there. I think he's going to get to that point. I think shacking up with the Joker is going to help him <laughs> become the, the Riddler that we know from, from the comics and the old TV shows and not so much. Maybe Jim Carrey's version as well. He might even take the name Nygma at some point, right? He might change his name to Nygma <laughs> like he did in the comics. We, we, we don't know. I love it. The ending is a lot of people are like conflicted on the ending. That That's where people kind of seem to have lost it or not. For me, the ending worked. Um, wholeheartedly, like I, I actually like the way he got his minions because I'm always every time you watch these movies, like, well, where did they get the goons from? Why do they always have, like, especially in the '66 Batman? It's like, well, why, why do people follow these criminals around? And obviously, the, like the Tim Burton one, that kind of, I don't know, like the the Penguin, I don't know, but Joker has like his gangsters are fine, and then the Joker in um, in the Dark Knight, they're the all the other gangsters. He's kind of made them all work for him because he's so crazy and and all that. So they kind of like they kind of find realistic ways to fit them in. This one I kind of liked. I like that he used the social media aspect to get it. And I loved if you read the chat beside, they'd say like where you can buy certain things yes. and what they'll bring. I focused and I love on that. that the most in the theater. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that aspect, and I also love that he had 500 followers and like 10 or 11 of them showed up. That's what I loved. I love that like all these people are like, yeah, we love you, we love you, we love you. Okay, let's do it. And the most of them are like, I'm not even going. Are you crazy? I can't do that. The reason why that worked was because it completely made sense. 
like let's let's call Riddler what he would have been back in the 70s. He would have been kind of like Charles Manson and how he would just walk up to people and preach his um his values or what or what he would call his values to these people who are also looking for the same similar kind of thing to him. He's almost like a cultist leader in that regard. And especially in our world today where we can reach so many more people because of social media, it made absolute sense that, like you said, he had 500 followers, but maybe 12 or 15 people came to his cause. Well, we don't even know if this 12 to 15 people were just people in Gotham and the remaining people, for all we know, they were in Metropolis, they were in New York. He could have had followers all around the world. That one social media aspect of this film really does have a lot of rippling effects because there could be other people doing Riddler style things in another part of another city. I mean, how awesome would it be if one of those people on that chat room was a copycat and he became the clue master. Yeah, or the puzzler. Yeah. Or the puzzler. Yeah. And then we can get more of the Bat family from that. And then we can get Stephanie Brown as the spoiler. A character yeah. like her would work in this aesthetic even better than Robin, if I have to say. Because she's way more of a rough and tumble character than any of the Robins. Okay, maybe Jason Todd, none, notwithstanding. But I'm looking at it more so in the sense of if they are trying to truly build a universe in this regard, right there, those followers, right there is how we get a whole bunch more crazies. And the Riddler is the one who created all of this, which is, which is, I think would be excellent. Oh, so I think that's a great idea. I'm curious how far, because they're calling this the Reeves verse, right? We have the Snyder verse, the MCU, the DCU, and so the Reeves verse. And what I love though is, Batman, like you just you just threw out all those characters. Batman is so rich. I've been saying this for a week now. Is Batman is its own MCU. It's its own universe. Yeah. You don't need you don't need to put him in with anybody else. He is who he is. There's so many around it. So I'm will I'm curious to see how deep Reeves gets with things and if he allows maybe another filmmaker is like, hey, I have an idea for this. And he's like, okay, go do that. Because it seems like that might be where he is with all these HBO Max things happening, right? It's like the Penguin might be his show, but then the Arkham Asylum show, I don't know how deep he is into it. Like, James Gunn was all about Peacemaker. I don't know how deep into it Matt Reeves is, aside from developing these shows. So I love that idea that Riddler Riddler is the one who creates the, the Batman universe over on DC. That's fantastic. It would be great if Reeves had some kind of say in what goes on with the DC shows that are using these characters, because James Gunn did exactly that with Peacemaker, and look look at how Peacemaker blew up. It, it's literally the best thing that DC that DC has done with a completely estranged character from them. But if Reeves can have that kind of say, where it could be at least, like you said, a director comes in, I have this really cool idea using your Batman with I don't know, let's let's just say it because people are going to want it with Superman. Okay, he sits down. He, he reviews it. Okay, here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. I'm going to be involved this much, but you use your vision. My character can't stray from this and have his, have his list. Not the producers. Let the director be the one who makes that call. I think it would work one, I think it would work wonderfully. Do I think a Superman could work in this world? Anything can work if it's done properly. Do I want to see that? Because we've been because we had Justice League that well, the Sonic Cut came out last year. I want, I want to be divorced from that a little bit. I want to just cultivate this Batman and his world and create this universe. We tried the Justice League idea, and they just went too far too fast with it. This movie was three hours long. They did it for a reason. They want to take their time. Let's keep that, let's keep that momentum going and take our time with everything else. If you're going to bring Dick Grayson into this, then let's make it make perfect sense as to why he would have a partner. Let's make everything within this make sense. I mean, shoot, it'll be even better because just like in um, Robin year one, Jim Gordon didn't want Batman having a, a kid partner, and he was on Batman's ass every single second. If anything happens to this boy, I'm coming after you. Anything happens to this boy, I'm coming after you. Let's see that with Jeffrey Rush. It could work very well. 
I mean, I bet you there's so many people out there thinking that the boy that he was what that he kept on saving throughout the movie, oh, that's going to be Robin. It's just an allegory of Bruce Wayne, but I can see why people would think that. Yeah, everybody went went on that. Um, it's a fun thought. I don't think that's the case. I think that no, kid doesn't all. that that kid doesn't show up uh, again. I don't think. I, and I I think if you're gonna get into Superman and stuff like that, let's. Let's uh, bring Gotham out of the water first. Let's let's deep well, flood he, Gotham he, before. He, he could be the one to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I look, I I actually like that Gotham is underwater now. I like the Riddler's plan went off. I like that they kind of subtly alluded to the fact that the the walls that the borders were kind of thin around the water walls and they had to repair them. I think that was in uh, Bay, Bella Royale. Is that her name? Bella Real's uh, campaign. Her. Um, debate against the mayor. I think yeah. that was her thing was that they wanted to secure that and finish that off. So I like that the Riddler's plan went off. I like that it's underwater. How did you feel about Gotham getting have all the explosions going up and then the being flooded at the end? I like the idea so much that Batman comes in. Haha, Riddler, I've stopped you. Oh, really? Snap his finger. Boom. The Riddler won. I love the idea that the Riddler won because what it does is it constantly keeps the hero on his toes. It creates more story ideas within this. It shows that it's not just he stops the villain, stands on a giant gargoyle, stares off at the bat signal, and then cut, then cut the credits. It shows that everything that the Riddler has done, from recruiting all these people to blowing up and damaging Gotham City as much as he has, that it all has lasting effects. I, I, I think it was wonderful that we got to see that the villain kind of did win in a way. And in a lot of ways, just like how you started off this whole conversation, the director, to me, did that to also say, hey, Nolan, you did that with the Joker? Well, I can do that with the Riddler, but I can have it have a lot more longer lasting um, uh, effects than what your supervillain did. Because the Joker didn't have any long-lasting effects, technically, but the Riddler did. The Riddler screwed up homes. He screwed up the economy. He screwed up. He screwed up lives, and that's going to take years to get fixed. If we do get another movie, this is going to be the main reason as to why Gotham falls even worse into decay. I guarantee that if they make another movie, we're still going to see Gotham kind of underwater to a degree, but it won't be physical water it'll be a metaphorical water everyone's gonna be drowning everyone will be drowning in debt everyone's gonna be drowning in poverty everyone's gonna be drowning in every other type of crap that you could think of and i think that's wonderful and that creates so many story possibilities and where you can go with this we might even see a spider-man 2 situation where batman's kind of like burnt out and maybe he considers i can't do this anymore I cannot continue this. I have help with the police, but it's taxing me, completely taxing me. And maybe that's how he creates more of his gallery of, of compatriots. Yeah, I think the one the one way the Riddler kind of loses at the end too is Batman realizes that he's been playing on the wrong side of the fence the whole time mm -hmm. and that vengeance shouldn't be his mo it should be hope and it should be helping and he should be he shouldn't be he shouldn't be a he shouldn't be feared but he should be endeared and, and i i think that that's going to play out i think the bruce wayne bruce wayne himself is going to change because of that ending as well um now this obviously the riddler still wins but this is the small little pieces to that where batman now is going to be batman he's going to get closer to the batman that we know the heroic batman um, hopefully he's still a detective when it's all said and done he's gonna but he's that, gonna come out with he's gonna come out in the next movie wearing a blue and gray suit and he's gonna talk like adam west and if he does that take my money now yeah, I, I'd be in on that. <laughs> I I love the take. I love the take on Batman. I love that he understood. I love that Catwoman's a villain. Like Catwoman is a villain. When he first meets Catwoman, she's breaking into the mayor's place, break opening a safe and robbing the mayor. She's that's a criminal. That is a criminal act. But he sees something in her and he trusts her. And it could be lust, but he he sees something in her and it's he Joey trusts Kravitz. her. I saw it too. <laughs> But he he relies on her though, right? He trusts her, and he and he gives her the benefit of the doubt. And I think that's something else that we haven't seen happen too too much in the movie Batman 
go, in the past is this Batman who kind of like okay he know he he's able to separate the Jokers from the Catwoman and he understands okay you're a problem but you might be an asset and I feel for you and there's something triggering you there's something off about you and the Joker you're just a psycho and he kind of has figured that and same with Riddler right Riddler's just a psycho he he I feel like he kind of understands the difference between the villains that he's facing as well which I really appreciated. Yeah, I appreciate that too about what what how he can separate that side of himself with these with these characters. I think that worked nicely. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question. How did you feel about good old reliable Alfred? Alfred Alfred was I thought Alfred was fine. I think he was okay. I my biggest gripe of the movie, to be honest with you, is that it felt like it needed an extra Alfred scene at the end. Yes. It was kind of like he gets blown up and then oh no, your father was a good man. And then that's it. He just like disappears from the movie. I thought they needed an extra Alfred scene at the moment. I actually didn't like him getting blown up uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, probably should have died. <laughs> like, yeah, I from, mean, from he that, got, yeah. If they yeah, like, go that far, they should have made it the. I'm just gonna say it because that's how we talked about it. It should have been the Aunt Harriet analog. It should have been her who got blown up. Oh, Mister Wayne, there you go. Boom. Yeah. It should have been her who got it. Yeah, I mean. Or no one should have been in the building. That's how I don't know. It should have been one or the other. Um, or the, and maybe or, or Wayne Manor just gets blown blown up, done. Like that. That's another possibility too. I didn't particularly care for the length of time that Alfred was in there because I know that they're really trying to hammer in the fact that Batman is the identity and Bruce Wayne is sorry. Batman's the real person and Bruce Wayne's the identity. Bruce Wayne doesn't exist, so that means we're not focusing on any aspect of the Bruce Wayne yeah. portion. But I always thought that Alfred was still going to be his man in the chair. He was always going to be the guy in his earpiece saying, yeah, go here, go there, go left, go up and down. Kind of, kind of like in um, Arkham Origins, my favorite Batman Arkham game. But, um, yeah, I, I felt that he personally was so downplayed. And you get someone as good as Andy Serkis and you don't use him, That's it, it's kind of like BBS when they had – uh, Jeremy Irons, and they don't use him any more than they already did. I felt like it was a little bit of a waste. They could have just gotten anybody to play Alfred. In this yeah, I, I thought it was like, we have to have Alfred in this movie. That's kind of how it felt. I was hoping for especially when they're like, he's British intelligence, and he trains Bruce. It's like, well, we didn't get any of that. Yeah. And like he had a couple of good moments, but I think he needed one, especially at the end. And I think honestly, you know what? I, maybe he should have, when the bomb goes off, maybe he should have been in the back cave. Like, it just, it, it was... Or he should have thrown it out the window. I don't know, but it just happened so fast. And he, I don't, there's so many explosions. There's two explosions where nobody gets hurt. Well, yeah. one guy kind of dies. But, you know, like, I, I, Batman's wearing armor, but Alfred is so close to that explosion that if you really wanted to kill Bruce Wayne with it, you would think that Alfred would have been off in that moment. And, and you can't kill Alfred off. And I don't like yeah. it when they... I don't like it when they Batman and Robin is like, he's dying. It's like, stop it. We know he's not going to die Nobody unless you die. have the strong... Yeah, unless you have the stones to actually do it, which you're not going to do in the first movie, don't even tease it. Just bring him somewhere. That's how I felt. I thought maybe take him somewhere else. That was so. Alfred was for me. Andy Circus is great. I still think he's better as Claw and Black Panther, and they should not have killed <laughs> yes. him off in that. Like he, when he died, yeah. I'm like, no, he's like, he was so good. I'm like, you can he keep was using. the most. I like Black Panther. I, I have a lot to say about Black Panther actually, but I, I enjoyed Black Panther a lot. But he was the reason that made it so enjoyable. He was he just was, he was having just absolute fun. Yeah. That's that was the best part. He was just having absolute balls to the wall fun and he made it so enjoyable. So when he died, okay, I get it. Storyline wise, it makes sense. But again, you're killing off another character that you can make use of somewhere else down the line. And he was just so good. I was so dis. I mean, yeah. yes, in the, in the plot it made sense, but I was so disappointed. I'm like, but he's yeah. so good. Like, because in Captain America is a Winter Soldier that he's in. He's like, okay, fine. But this one, he was so good. I'm like, we need more Andy Serkis in movies. Civil War. It was Civil War. Oh, Civil War. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then in, and now it's like, nah. you know, but and in Batman, it's like, I don't know. I felt he was underutilized, underused. I think I really, as long as the movie is, I really felt like it needed one, maybe a little less motorcycle driving in a cemetery at the end and an extra scene of Alfred. <laughs> I just felt like Alfred needed to come back. We needed him. But so you, you and, felt similar yeah. to that? Oh, I felt completely the same with that. And especially because, um, like I said, you could, pin, you could pinpoint which books that they pulled from this. And this Alfred is straight up from Batman Earth One um, that came yeah. out, I believe, in 2011, 2010, something like that. And he plays a really big part in 
Bruce becoming who he is now. So I was really hoping that we were going to see a lot more of that. Not him training Bruce as a kid, but maybe the two of them having a sparring session. Because this Batman seems like the kind of guy who during the day will be exercising and training and doing that kind of stuff. So I was hoping to see that kind of stuff with him. Like, if we're going to go Earth to Alfred, then let's see Alfred actually do some hand-to-hand stuff, you know what I mean, with Bruce. Let's see that aspect go. But we didn't get that. So, yeah, like, they should have cut down maybe on a little bit of that tail end scene with him and Catwoman riding their separate ways on the motorcycles. Like, I, I don't think that was overly necessary, but I would have liked to have seen more Alfred doing Alfred things. Yeah, the motorcycle scene was fine. It was a good little ending. But yeah, we needed more Alfred. And I think to your point about Alfred training him, I think that's what... I don't know if there's deleted scenes of it or not, but I know that in the prequel novel, that like that's a big part of it, is that Alfred taught him how to fight. He taught him yeah. Bruce Jitsu. So it's exactly what you said, only instead of putting it in a movie, they put it in a book for 10-year-olds. I don't understand. <laughs> you know, We didn't need to see it, I guess, but I think they needed... I just, I just... I don't know. There was something missing in Alfred in this, and... You know, I, I like Dory and Harriet. I, I thought she was. I was glad they brought her back, even yeah. though they changed her name. I don't know why they changed her name. They should have kept her and Harriet. Maybe they don't have the rights to that. I don't know. But I like that. <laughs> I just I like the aspect of it. I just think one extra scene of 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 Alfred being Alfred, and maybe turning into the Alfred that you're alluding to, like being like, "Hey, going forward, I'm going to be in your ear. I'm your right hand man. I'm fine, by the way. Also, you should know that I'm." <laughs> I'm not dead. That would have been good, good as well. So that that for me, those that the other weak part I had was the ramp while he's chasing the penguin, and the one truck just randomly like unlatches, and then it creates a ramp for him to drive up right in front of him. I was like, well, that's a little convenient. I kind of wish yeah, he had to yeah. drive to that a little bit. I mean, it was a great scene. That seems phenomenal. Don't get me wrong, but that one moment, I was like, ah, oh, man, really? You you cheat? You you got it cheap on me you know you're hyper realism and then you have that i'm like well, might as well hey, throw dude, in mr I... freezing clay face and on that note brian we're going to wrap it up for this week but we'll be back to talk more batman because there's a lot more to say a lot more comics to compare it to where should yes. everybody find you at um right now just on facebook it's just brian ray on facebook and you can check out my website brian.raymond.ray sorry that's not it my, my bad brianroyer.weebly.com if you want to check out some of my artwork and you definitely should have got some stuff in there that you're going to want to check out. We'll be back again. Like I said, thank you so much for watching. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. And until next time, may you be the master of your own universe.